This is the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. They fought for us, now he'll fight for you. The pursuit of justice and liberty. It's the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. And now, Bob Cordaro. Road Scholar Transport is proud to sponsor Camp Freedom, where veterans go to heal and find peace. Go to roadscholar.com forward slash Camp Freedom today and tell our veterans what their sacrifice means to you. Your message may be chosen for display on Road Scholar Transport trailers to be seen by thousands of people. Show our veterans how much you care. Send them your message today. Road Scholar Transport, a higher standard. Great good uh, Sunday morning, everyone, and welcome to the Bob Cadaro Show on TV. We have a, a special show today. I, one of the things that I think our area does so well, unfortunately, is send people with great talent out to live elsewhere. <laughs> and they, they remember us fondly. And they keep their ties because they love this area, but their careers have taken them elsewhere. And these expatriates, I call them, expats, uh, are spread throughout the country. But one that, that I was intrigued with for a number of years was a great basketball player and by every account, great man by the name of Steve Vesendak. And Steve Vesendak, he starred in basketball, Scranton Prep, he starred uh, for Duke University, and he went on to a career in college athletics. I mean, just really shown the area in its best light. And, and so a, a bunch of his friends and contemporaries have decided to get together and throw a tribute for Steve. And I, I, they've all told me he reluctantly accepted. But he comes back to the area, and, and, and so he said, I'll come back and do this thing. So uh, on October 31st at uh, Bonavita in Dunmore, Riley Street in Dunmore, they're going to have a tribute to Steve Vesendak. And that gave me the opportunity because we're throwing, talking about it on the radio show. It gave me an opportunity to get in touch with Steve and have a conversation and say, Steve, would you do the TV show? And he's agreed to do it. So we've got him by Zoom today. Steve Vesendak, welcome. Thank you, Bob. I really appreciate all those nice comments. Well, Steve, let's talk about it. You're a North Scranton guy. And where did you grow up? Actually, in Green Ridge Corners, right uh, there uh, off Sanderson Avenue in the corner of Sanderson and Electric. My dad had a bake shop at 1805 Sanderson Avenue, uh, right across from the funeral home. Yeah. So I grew up in that area because we had everything we needed at Green Ridge Corners. At that time. We had two barbers, <laughs> we had two doctors. We had a great school. We had two grocery stores. Everything was there. Yeah. Uh, all right. So you grew up in, in uh, the 50s. And, and I mean, it was idyllic, wasn't it? It's amazing. Um, when I think back about how secure and uh, it, it was like a dreamlike world because I didn't have uh, and none of us had really any worries or concerns or about safety or our future. It was just almost felt like it was a plan. In school, once in a while, you had to duck and cover. Other than that, you were good, right? Everything was fine. <laughs> so your, your father was a baker. And uh, how many siblings? I had a brother and a sister, uh, Tom and uh, Suzanne. And uh, we grew up together in a very, very family-oriented environment. Yeah. You start to play basketball. How did you discover basketball? Well, I just, uh, Robert Morse, uh, uh, grade school was right around the corner, two blocks away. And I went over there. Uh, my dad bought me a basketball and I went over there and shot and couldn't reach the rims. Uh, but I always wanted to. And then um, it, it, when I was eight years old, uh, my dad was able to get me um, signed up for a bitty basketball team at St. Paul's. Uh, and... Um, it was a great, great opportunity decision. Uh, Father Hines was our coach. And I never knew priests could swear. But <laughs> I didn't think they were allowed to do that. But when, when the game started, 
Uh, Bob Hines took the collar off, rolled up his sleeve, and he, he reminded me of Popeye the Sailor. He had these huge forearms, <laughs> and he would flail away at those referees. And occasionally a word or two would slip, but I would I, I always remember that impression that it, it, he'd let one go and not even think anything of it. And, uh, <laughs> but he was a great, great man and, 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 and someone that I looked up to because he showed the intensity that the game was all about and that he was as much a part of the game as we were because he was enjoying himself in spite of what the referees did. <laughs> but it was a good experience. And I played um, uh, bitty basketball from uh, eight to age 12. And um, it was, it was just a wonderful. I, and I know you don't want to brag on yourself. You're not that kind of guy, but w at that point, did you start to see that you were separating from the pack as a basketball player? Did you see it that early? No, not at all. I just thought I was just another one of the guys playing the game. And I don't know, I, I can't even think of ever who was the high scorer in any of those games or the leading rebound or anything like that. And I was just playing the game for the fun of it and uh, enjoying it. Now, there's that, those are the days pre-participation trophy. <laughs> you were out there to win. <laughs> exactly right. I can tell you a cute story about my experience over at Robert Morris. When I went over there when I was eight or nine years old, uh, the bigger guys were playing the one basket they always played at. And, uh, and I asked him, I said, uh, could I play? And they said, no, you're too small. Well, about three or four late years later, five years later, I asked them if I could play, and they said, "No, you're too good." So I never got much. <laughs> so I never had much of an experience playing over there. I could shoot by myself and, and play in the rain and the snow, but I didn't have a chance to play too much basketball there. When did the devotion that you had to the game begin for you? Well, it it it, it game it. it it began with Bill Garrity at North Grant Junior High School. Mm -hmm. um, but he was, it was not just basketball, it was just sports in general. Um, he was a great mentor, uh, someone who uh, wanted us, first of all, to be, you know, good guys, good citizens of the school, uh, not getting any trouble, do our homework and all the things we're supposed to do. And then, and he was one of the, early folks of the old school that said, Hey, mind your P's and Q's and then you get a chance to play. Yeah. And, um, and I'll always, always remember that he was always caring and I, and I played for him in the seventh and eighth grade. And then it really got intense when I got started at the prep with uh, coach Gallagher. And that's the old days. What year are you talking about uh, when when you started um, prep? I would have started uh, in 1958, probably at the prep. Okay. And then graduated in 62. And Coach Gallagher, uh, after Bill Garrity, after Father Hines, is a very formative character for Steve Vicendak. Very much so. And as a matter of fact, I can remember how that occurred. One, one day I came home from school and my dad at the dinner table, we were just sitting around having dinner. And he looked at me, he said, by the way, you're going to prep next year. Well, you know, that was out of a clear blue sky. I had no inkling. I had, I had never even thought about it. We never discussed it. <laughs> that was going to happen. And, uh, I, I, uh, I just thought that, oh, my goodness gracious, those, those, those guys are really smart at the prep. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit in or anything yeah. like that. So I had this image of the culture at the school, and and uh, I don't mind telling you that I was it was intimidated that first day. I'll ask a naive question: Was that the uh, were were they in the new school building at the time? Oh no no no, we were in the old we were in, in the, the old school. IBM building, I guess, or wasn't well, that? I don't know what it was before, but it, it was an old building there in the corner. Then there was a little building, uh, two story building. Uh, separated from, from it at the back of the playground. And then, of course, there was the uh, where the Jesuits lived, the big uh, uh, home where they lived. And then there was another university or building with a basement that we uh, uh, we ate lunch in. So it was a scattered a bunch of buildings. Um, but I do remember uh, playing 
you know, we, we didn't have a gym to practice in. So we were practicing outside early part of the year. Yeah. I remember one basket was nine and a half feet tall and the other basket was 10 and a half feet tall. They never, they never could get it right because they just sank or whatever. And I know there are many days we swept water off the courts and even occasionally a light snow and went out there and practiced, but it was, that was the way it was. And, and um, coach Gallagher didn't, didn't take much uh, heed to us complaining about the wind or the water on the court or anything like that. We, we, <laughs> Well, it was wonderful. Steve Vicendak, obviously something worked for not only you, but the Scranton prep team. You were very successful in what then was almost the class of uh, high school basketball, the uh, state Catholic uh, organization. Without question. Uh, and that's a great credit to uh, uh, Coach uh, Gal was, you know, he, he was much more than a coach. I mean, he was involved in your life off the court as well. And, uh, and he, and, and, and uh, he liked to say, if I'm not yelling at you, I don't care about you. <laughs> and uh, so he knew, I know he cared a lot for me, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but he, he was good for everybody. I mean, everybody blossomed under him within their own abilities and framework. Not everybody could be a point guard. Not everybody could be a center, but he found a way to bring out the best in their basketball skills. And like, uh, like father Hines, he had an ability to articulate the English language in a way I wasn't familiar with uh, early on. He, uh, he was pretty intense and, uh, and he kept us on our toes all the time. And, uh, we didn't get any breaks for not doing homework or having conflicts with uh, away games or practices. That was just, we had to get it done. And if you had to stay up until 1, 1 30 in the morning to get your homework, you did it. And it, yeah, that, that's the other point. The Jesuit education at that time was the basics, including Latin. And it was, it was hardcore. Absolutely. And, and they took no prisoners. You know, they, 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 uh, <laughs> Uh, they, they they made sure that everyone uh, was treated exactly the same on any infraction. Uh, <laughs> Jug. <laughs> but they were wonderful. They were wonderful leaders and 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 role models for so many of us. Some some weren't athletes, but they were. In, they went into uh, you know uh, debating. We had a great debating team and some other areas. We had uh, glee club. Uh, everything they touched. Uh, was done with the understanding that you had the responsibility to do your best and they were going to bring it out of you yeah. one way or another. How, um, how tall are you at this time, your junior, senior year in high school? About six, one, six, one and a half. So were you, you, you weren't able to play guard at that time. Were you, what did you play? No, I played like um, a small forward, a forward and maybe occasionally center depending on the circumstance when I, First played my sophomore year, I was a guard. And I played uh, because I was really the youngest one on the team as far as uh, experience is concerned. So I got to play guard there, uh, not necessarily the point guard, but uh, kind of like a, an off guard. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and i never forget Willie Whitt Whittaconis, who had a nice career at the University of Scranton, was a senior on that team. And before my first game, on the varsity. And I was, I was nervous, you know, because I was a sophomore and they, Gal didn't start any sophomores. That wasn't his. Where game. did you play your games? Was it at the CYC at that uh, point? Yes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we, and we practiced in, in, as some at the, the, the YWCA, uh, um, I mean the W yeah, the YWCA, which was on, in the basement, the lower, the basement of that building had just two baskets there. Yeah, but um, uh, Willie came up to me before the game, and 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 knew I, he must have known I was nervous. He said, he said, "He said, Steve, listen, don't worry. You're starting because you deserve to start, and you're going to do fine." Yeah, and it was so encouraging to hear that from him at that time that that I'll never forget it. And, and as a matter of fact, as something that really always stuck with me is that anytime you can help someone younger than you to feel better about where they are and what they're about to do, that's a good thing. 
And you ought to think about doing that as often as you can. That's a great lesson. That's a great lesson to draw from that. Steve, so your, your high school career begins. You're starting as a sophomore. We get into senior year, or maybe before that, and and Scranton Prep is uh, state playoff bound and contending. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, you know uh, one of the nice things about playing at the prep, uh, and I and I want to say this in a way that is not uh, an exaggeration or arrogance or whatever, but. After a while, you become a part of a culture and you expect to win. Yeah. You know, uh, 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 when you lose, it's kind of a surprise. And that carried on later on in my career at Duke. I mean, we were surprised when we got beat. We know we got beat. But the wins were becoming a part of that culture helped create some wind for our success, too. We weren't the starters of that. We were just we just caught part of the the drift from the earlier classes that had been successful too, to a certain degree. Um, so, uh, but we had all, all three years were good, good for the prep as far as wins and losses. Did you think you were going to uh, have an opportunity to play big time college basketball? No, not at all. I didn't, I didn't really think of that. I was just caught up in the moment of enjoying so much being a part of prep basketball and, and basketball in general. I, I never really did think of big time basketball. Uh, and I, and I'll be honest with you that even, even when I was being recruited by some really nice schools, um, I, I didn't think of myself as a big time basketball player. I was just trying to be someone who got a scholarship and got to play some or yeah. made the team. Uh, my, uh, I'll tell you a story about the recruiting. Uh, when I went to Camp All America basketball camp over in Cornwall in the Hudson, New York, at uh, New York Military Academy, which was the premier basketball camp for college basketball players to go and play summer ball and, and improve against great competition from all across the country. Uh, Gal worked there, and but I was too young to be a counselor. So they made me a lifeguard. I was a lifeguard at 16 or 17 years old. But they let me play in the counselor's games at night. When they, the barracks, the kids went to sleep at like 10 o'clock. And then from 10 o'clock, sometimes until 3 or 4 in the morning, we were in the gym playing. Yeah. And I got to play against some of the finest players on the East Coast. And it so happened that during that time, Jeff Mullins from Duke, who became later an All-American and a great pro with the San Francisco Warriors, and a kid from North Carolina called Ray Respis from Pantego High School down on the eastern part of the state of North Carolina. Ray went to North Carolina and was a player with uh, for North Carolina. And, and Jeff went home and called Coach Bubis and told him, hey, there's a kid up here you need to see. He's really good. As a matter of fact, he's a pain in the neck. Hmm. Uh, he guards me and I, I have trouble scoring against him. And Ray apparently went back and told Dean Smith, who had just taken the job after Frank McGuire had left to go to the uh, Philadelphia Warriors to coach Will Chamberlain and Al Adels in that group. And, and Dean got the job. So as a result of that, I uh, the, the second weekend in September of my senior year in, in high school, before I even went, to class. I visited Duke University and they offered me a scholarship. And the next weekend, Dean Smith offered me the first scholarship he offered in his coaching career mm. to me. So before I even started, I had a scholarship to Duke and Carolina. And now it's even a bigger thing than it was then because I'm, you know, from Northeastern Pennsylvania, I had no idea about the intensity of that rivalry yeah. and the level of basketball being played. And so uh, Coach Smith only had two out-of-state scholarships to give that year because they had some issues with gambling in the ACC tournament. And the chance of this, uh, of this North Carolina system limited state and Carolina to only two out-of-state scholarships. And so he gave me one, and he held that scholarship for me until the following June because I couldn't make up my mind 
between Duke and Carolina, it was really a tough decision. Yeah. Had to be. Obviously, yeah. you, you picked Duke. Do you remember why? Well, I picked Duke because I got to know some of the players. I got to know the players a little bit more at Duke than I did at Carolina. And and Duke was actually, believe it, it's, it's not a very large undergraduate school. Even now, it only has 6,600 undergraduates. That's It's limited by the board of the trustees. So it felt a little bit more comfortable for me uh, to be in that environment. Uh, but I would have gotten a great education at Carolina, too. Uh, and I didn't, ha- I didn't have any doubt about that. It's just a matter of which one I think was more comfortable at the time. And I uh, I love Coach Boobs and, and Coach Smith. Matter of fact, I like to tell the story that Coach Smith and I remained good friends for many, many years, um, as long as I can remember, because he so appreciated the fact that I didn't accept the scholarship and go to Carolina and screw up his coaching career. <laughs> uh, Steve Sundak, so uh, you go to Duke and one of one of a rare Northeast Pennsylvanians who go to Division One big time. And how do you fit in there as a basketball player? Well, I, I, I don't know if I had thought about it. I might have had even more reservations beforehand, because when I got there, uh, they had brought in six freshmen on scholarship and they had 14 on scholarship in the varsity. So it was going into a, a loaded deck, so to speak, <laughs> with talent. And they had brought in uh, three guards and three forwards freshman year. And they had oodles of talent, Art Heyman, Jeff Mullins uh, on the varsity. Uh, Jay Buckley and Hack Tyson were both 6'11", tallest team in America. They had all kinds of talent on the varsity and they went to the final four their my freshman year and lost uh, to Loyola. So I, I don't know that I really thought uh, as much about being successful, that successful on the basketball court. I, can, I was more concerned. I wanted to get a great education because of the Jesuit influence on my life and, 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 and the, uh, the priority of, how important a good education would be for the remainder of my life. And so uh, I wanted to go to a really good academic school. And, um, and, and it, as it turned out, I did, but I was more afraid again, here I am going in, like going in the prep the first year, I'm going into Duke university on a strange campus, 600 miles from home, not knowing hardly anybody. And I was, I did not want to disappoint my mom and dad. I was not, going to fail out of that school and come back home with my tail between my legs. That wasn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. So I, I did all I could to academically um, to have some success. And, and then when I felt a little bit more comfort academically, I decided, well, I'm not going to go home for because of basketball either. Yeah. I'm not, they're not going to send me home because I'm not good enough. And so I had all the incentive in world and incentive in the world to do well in both areas because of my parents. When do you break out at Duke as a basketball player? Well, I think um, my freshman year, I had a lot of, I've had, I had some success. Jack Marin and I were very good um, as far as um, we scored a lot in, in freshman level. And the freshmen back then were, as you know, were ineligible. Yeah. So we played all the other freshman teams, North Carolina States, North Carolinas, Wake Forest, and a lot of uh, teams. And, I felt comfortable uh, that I could compete at that level. Now, how well, I didn't know how well, but I could compete. I thought I could get out and play and not embarrass myself. And so uh, it, it, it just evolved. And then I think my sophomore year, we had a really good team there, my sophomore year. And Jack and I both, you know, I didn't get to start that year either, but we went to the final four. And we lost to North uh, to the to UCLA the first time they won the national championship mm. in 1964 in Kansas City. But I got to play a lot in that game. I played against Gail Goodrich, Walt Hazard. Um, it, 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 we just had a, a, a very fine basketball team. But I kind of earned my spurs that year from the standpoint of having more confidence that I could compete because here we are 
playing in the final four for the national championship on national television yeah. and I'm playing. So I came back to junior year and uh, they pulled a fast one on me. Uh, we played three guards and I wound up being the small forward. We had two other guards to play, Bob Verg and Denny Ferguson, and they made me the small forward. So I was guarding guys six, seven, six, eight, and getting the heck beat out of me physically, yeah, yeah. to tell you the truth. But I kept moving. And by the second half, that big guy was tired. He was slowing <laughs> down a little bit. Now I got even in the second half. But we, we, we had some success there. And then, of course, senior year, we had a great team, a wonderful team. Tell us about senior year at Duke. Senior year, we had uh, Bob Verger, who was an All-American. Jack Marin was an All-American. Mike Lewis was an All-American. And I was on and I was playing uh, the point guard. And we had a, a young man, a kid from Allentown named Bob Reedy, who was six foot eight and a good player. But he wasn't getting much recognition because he was kind of like slotted to get some rebounds and play defense while everyone else got a little bit more of the attention. Uh, from the media and, and so forth, because they were, we were, we were good scorers. We, we could all score. Um, and the three point shot didn't exist, which I wish it did. <laughs> because we would have scored. I don't know how many points because Marin and Bergen, myself, we could play, we could, we could shoot the three points. How uh, far does the, the, the team go in your senior year? We went to the final four again. That was the, it was the final four in, um, in College Park that uh, Texas Western won that, with that famous game between Texas Western and Kentucky. Well, Friday night, we played Kentucky with uh, uh, Larry Conley and uh, Louis Dampier and uh, uh, some good players. And they beat us in the semifinal game on Friday night. Uh, Pat Riley also played on that team who had some success in the NBA as a coach. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, they beat us uh, and our leading scorer, Bob Verga had gotten sick and he didn't play. And so we lost about, you know, 26 points a game, 25 points a game in scoring. And that's not an excuse. Kentucky whipped us fair and square that night. And then the next night we played a, a Utah university of Utah team who got no recognition but they had two players who went and played great careers in the NBA. Jerry Chambers it was was really just one of the wonderful uh, forwards and played with the Lakers, I think. I, you know, it's funny. Uh, I remember all these names and I'm, I'm a little younger than you, but I remember all these names. Uh, I'm going to interrupt you there because uh, that's our show on WNEP. We're going to go to Steve Vicendak's professional career. And then his career in college academics as we continue the Bob Cadaro Show on TV on YouTube. You can catch us there. Until next Sunday, though, this is the Bob Cadaro Show on WNEP-TV. Road Scholar Transport is proud to sponsor Camp Freedom, where veterans go to heal and find peace. Go to roadscholar.com forward slash Camp Freedom today and tell our veterans what their sacrifice means to you. Your message may be chosen for display on Road Scholar Transport trailers to be seen by thousands of people. Show our veterans how much you care. Send them your message today. Road Scholar Transport, a higher standard. Well, we're talking with Steve Vicendak. We got him all as far as the final four in his senior year. But now we're going to get into really the meat of everything that Steve Vicendak did and was and is. Uh, so, Steve, you, you don't you get to the final four twice in a college career. And then when you were a freshman, the team got there, too. This was a remarkable run for Duke. It was it was something special, and let me tell you about the guys on those teams, the players. On those, they they all graduated. They got their degree. Most of them, I think, almost all of them got their degree in four years. Yeah. So we were one of the last groups of you know really successful players at that that time who stayed together for four years and graduated yeah. as a group. And it was really a nice feeling. How did you, know, you feel? Have great relationships with. Them. Did you know? When you played, when Duke played UCLA in 1964, did you know that was the beginning of the wooden era, that dominance that uh, the Wizard of Westwood uh, had created? Did you have a sense of that? Or did you say, wait, we're Duke. They're just UCLA. 
No, a matter of fact, uh, let me tell you about that. We played UCLA um, my senior year, back to back in North Carolina. Most people don't realize that up here. We played them on a Friday and a Saturday night. And we beat them by 19 or 20 some points each night. We, we, we were pretty good. Yeah. And they were really good. But we were a part of that the success of that era. Uh, and we knew that, uh, uh, you know, he was bringing in some great players. Kareem uh, was in the next year was yeah. recruited by, by him. And, and, and we just got finished. And so he came in with a four year period. And then of course he, he, he got some other guys coming in for a 10 year period. He won 10 national championships, but we didn't have an inclination that there would that would be that type of domination. Matter of fact, I think if you asked us at that time, we would have said, "We well, Duke will be in the top four or five every year for some time, or and, and no reason not to, or whatever." Yeah. But it, 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 things changed, and uh, he 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 was a great coach, great man, and um, uh, but had no inkling of the success that he was going to yeah. enjoy. So, so Steve Vicendek is honored, uh, great player. You get you, amazing experience going to the Final Four. I mean, most of us as fans could not, and athletes can't comprehend that experience. It's something that could never be taken away or or uh, reduced in value. And then the uh, professional scouts start another round of your career begins tell us uh, tell us about that yeah i um i was uh, uh offered a uh, you know an opportunity to play pro basketball which i really really enjoyed uh playing i played uh played with you know, the pittsburgh pipers the first year i mean and uh ironically at that time uh they were starting in the aba they were starting their training camp uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. And I went out there and had some great workouts. Uh, Vince Cassetta was our coach at that time. And they were just bringing in player after player because they were competing against the NBA. And um, I got my draft notice that I was getting drafted. So I had to report for active duty. And I spent four months of that first year in the Army. About and, that. And, and then... Army Reserve, and it got my honorable discharge, which I'm very proud of, six years later. But so that first part of that first year, I was in the Army learning how to be a soldier and being very frustrated when I really wanted to be out there in the basketball court, uh, quite honestly. I went to basic uh, training in uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and then went to uh, advanced in, in, in individual training at uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And they really aren't, I wouldn't say too many people sign up for vacations at either spot. Did you think um, that you were back with the Jesuits? <laughs> <laughs> well, drill sergeants are someone <laughs> very familiar, but uh, not quite the same. But to go uh, from, I, 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 that's amazing. You, you went from the bright lights of the final four to the dust and dirt of basic training in this man's army. That, that's, that's a remarkable transformation yeah. in terms of what you see and experience. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, you know, it, 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 it was important for me to do what I had to do, okay, and, and, and not feel frustrated or let it upset me uh, to the degree that I'd be unhappy. Uh, my dad had a once pulled me aside and it's always stuck with me. He said, Steve, he said, Stephen, let me tell you something. I'm not going to try to make you happy. That's your job. I love you. Yeah. And he walked away and I realized, and then later on I asked him about it and he said, well, listen, son, there's some people who let a rainy day, get them down. Yeah. What, the, what does the rain have to do with a bad day? Or some people don't like because the wind's blowing or they don't like the color of the, of the car that their dad bought for them or yeah. silly things. Yeah. I mean, 
you know, the only person in the world responsible for your happiness is you, the only person. And you need to understand it. So that kind of, I evolved a kind of an outlook. It really helped me playing basketball because I, you know, sometimes you could hear people say some things that they probably wouldn't say in the church, you know, <laughs> yelling at you from the stands. Okay. But I took on, I took the attitude that, listen, the more they yelled at me, the more they were really pulling for me because they were pulling so much against me that I, they had to pull for me. I had to be, I had, I had to be good. So I, I, so I took that, what I call the Scranton approach and just turned around a negative and made it a positive. And I think that that's true when you're playing and people, are, I love to play on the road more than at home sometimes because the intensity of the environment against you was much you know, much, much more noticeable than obviously playing at home. We yeah. expected to win at home, Yeah. you know, all the time in, in Cameron Indoor Stadium, as it's turned out to be a pretty good place to play. <laughs> but, uh, but I love playing on the road because I love to walk, just walk off the court, not, not make any gestures or pound my chest or point my finger or anybody, just walk off the court. And uh, it, it helped me a lot. And, I, and it, 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 it's always been a, a important part of my, uh, I think, uh, in, uh, strengths as an athlete is to walk off the court, yeah. feeling good about what you did, whether you won or lost. You know, there's there's some games that got I got what got whipped <laughs> pretty good, but I didn't feel bad if I played my best. The other guy was better, yeah, and I didn't let that get me down. I mean, that, you just, okay, he's better. Go back. you got three days to practice to get ready for the next guy. And let him walk off the court with uh, a loss under his belt. A, a, so I, I a reminder, uh, we're going to have, uh, there's, they're going to have a tribute to Steve Vicendak, October 31st, 5 o'clock at La Bonavita in Dunmore. Uh, and that's, that's the reason we're getting together here to talk about that and promote it. That has something going back to, to do with Bill Garrity, does it not? Oh, sure. Of, of course. You know, and, 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 and all the coaches, you know, they, they expected you to win, you know, the right way, but they expected you to even more to lose the right way. And, and some of those, some of those approaches and attitudes are different today than when I played and, and I grew up. And I'm very fortunate to have grown up, grown up when I did because I, I think I did learn how to win gracefully and to lose even more gracefully. Yeah. And, of course, some people would go crazy. Oh, you, you got to growl when you lose and kick the dog when you come in. No, I don't think so. I don't agree with that at all. Yeah. So you're – You've got your four months. You've got to go through basic. You come back to the ABA. And what people, a lot of people don't remember, the ABA was a premier league. I mean, you're talking about incredible talent. Uh, and you're with Pittsburgh Pipers with Connie Hawkins. Well, Bob, you're hitting the nail on the head. The ABA, there were only 12 NBA teams at yeah. the time. Only 12. So that meant only maybe 15 or 20 new players got to make the teams from year to year from the colleges. And I think it was uh, two or three. Uh, uh, the first year of the All-Star game, the first year of the All-Star game, after the leagues had combined, remember they merged? Yes. 40% of the All-Stars in that NBA All-Star game were from the ABA. Sure, you had Dr. J, Dr. J, well, Dr. J you, you know, the it. Iceman. Uh, you had all kinds of great players. Gilmore, I mean, I mean and, yeah. And, and here's the other thing. We played a wide-open game, the three-point shot, yeah. shot clock. We were playing basketball the way they played in the Rutgers League in, in New York City, where all the great players would come. Did you ever play there? Play. Never did play there. Okay. No. But I've been by there yeah. and watched some games. It's fantastic. It's a It's a – Whole different world, but the dunks and the block shots, our scores. I think one year, the if I'm correct, the NBA average maybe about 89 points a game uh, for a season. 
we averaged closer to 100. Yeah. And we and then that red, white, blue ball was all over the place. You could How did see you like it. that basketball? I loved it. I loved it. You know, you could see the rotation on the ball. You could always find it against the backdrop of the uh, of the stands. You know, when that brown ball goes up in the air, sometimes you lose it a little bit. Uh, you know, fans do. And I think fans find it more exciting to, to watch the flight of the ball. Yeah. And so it, how many it was, years in the ABA? I played three years. What's the roster of what's the roster of players that you can recall that you played against and with? Oh gosh, you know we played against Larry Brown, Doug Moe, uh, uh, the uh, a lot of fellas that uh, Louis Dampier uh, played uh, at, at Louisville, um, uh, Merv Jackson, a lot of players that didn't receive much recognition because you know most of the most of the highlights were on the, the really bigger schools, but there were a lot. There's only 12 teams in the NBA. That means there were probably, let's say, uh, 120, 150 players Yeah, in the entire NBA. Do you know how many good players or basketball there are that never get any recognition? And they, they all were able to make, have an opportunity to make the, uh, expand the, uh, their opportunities in the ABA. And it was exciting stuff. I mean, yeah. we had a lot of fun. It was, it was good. It was good for basketball. It was good for the fans. What what years did you play in the ABA? From sixty eight to 72, 71, 72. And now, I loved it. And then I got a job all for making more money with Converse Rubber Company. <laughs> and so that tells you how much the the, the, the salary. You remember was what was what was your first salary I'm and how even, how much did you finish? Let me tell you what a first round contract was in the NBA in 1966. First round, fifteen thousand dollars a year, mm. and um, uh, it was. Uh, it, it, but you, but you were playing for the fun of the game and, 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 and playing basketball, but you also were playing not to get cut and have to go back. And a lot of guys have to go back and be a substitute teacher. Didn't have jobs. Yeah. They didn't have a, a career to fall back on. So th- those, those tryout camps in the ABA were intense. They were <laughs> physical. They, they weren't the guys helping you get up off the floor and say, Oh, I'm sorry. I knocked you down or anything like that. They were, they were trying to protect their family's future. Yeah. And, um, how does the converse thing come about? They, they well, were the. That's the other thing. People, you know, people don't remember in that era. Converse was Nike and Adidas and everybody all at once. They were that big, right? Well, the the, um, uh, the converse thing came about because I think Dean Smith, who was a converse coach at the time, was contacted by one of uh, the directors of promotion, Joe Dean at Converse and said, Hey, listen, do you know of any, any players that, you know, we could hire to go out and be a sales and promotional representative. And I think coach Smith mentioned my name and I met with uh, Joe Dean and Gib Ford, the vice president of, of Converse and for an interview in Washington, DC. I'll never forget it. And you're a young guy. You're 25, 26 years old. This is yeah, not 24, 25. Yeah. yeah 24, 25. And they offered me a job, and they and I had a territory. They they said you're going to have a territory of North Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia. Now, do you know how important North Carolina was to Converse as far as exposure? Look at Nike. I mean, everybody, you know, all the schools that play basketball, the big ones uh, were in that area. Yeah. So I had Virginia and West Virginia, and my responsibility was to.
little bit and get involved. And I got involved with coaching at Little Greensboro College in North Carolina and liked it, you know, very much. Uh, but Tom Butters, the athletic director at Duke, was looking for someone to be his associate athletic director. And he interviewed me, contacted me, and I turned him down. And I turned him down, oh, I'd say three times. And every time I turned him down, he offered me more money. Mm. He really, it was really funny. It was, <laughs> and, I, and I said, Tom, I'm not playing games. But I just, I'm very happy here just coaching a little basketball here at Division Three school. And finally, he breaks me down and I agree to, agree to take the job. And the first thing he does, he, 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 I, I, I agree to take what the job. Year are you, what year are you, is this and how old are you? Uh, I'm probably about, uh, let's see, maybe 30, somewhere in that range. Uh, no, I'll be, I'll be about 35, 36. Okay. And uh, he said, listen, the ACC tournament's going on in March. And um, this would have been March of 1980. Okay. And he says, I'm going to the ACC tournament. I want you to come join me. So I'm sitting there with him and he turns to me and says, by the way, your first job is to hire us a new basketball coach. And I looked at him like he was, you know, Bill Foster, who is a very successful coach. He's, they're playing for uh, the ACC championship. Yeah. He says, listen, no one knows. Bill's leaving to go to South Carolina. The only people who know are you, me, the athletic director in South Carolina, and Bill. We, our wives don't even know. They were trying to keep it quiet, obviously. And he says, you can go out. And, and I, of course, I was, I thought he was kidding me, of course. I mean, uh, but he wasn't. And he said, you got an unlimited budget and go out there and find us a coach. So I went out and started working at it and brought in five or six names. Um, Tom Davis from uh, Boston College at the time. And I'm trying to think of some of the others. And, uh, and, 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 and I got a phone call one day from Coach Gallagher. And Coach Gallagher said to me, he says, uh, Steve, he said, uh, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing fine, Coach. He said, would you, I know you're, I hear you're heading up the search for the basketball coach at Duke. I said, yes. Did you, you didn't well, ask, how did you know that, Coach Gallagher? <laughs> well, no, it was no, it was made known because yeah. all they, all the all the applications had to come to me. They were they were coming to to my office. Yeah. I had to answer them all and sort them out and everything. And so, because <laughs> it had been it had been going on for maybe a, a couple of weeks. It was a big deal. Yeah, it was really right. a big deal for Bill Foster to leave Duke to go to South Carolina. For, for a basketball position. A strange move. <laughs> yeah, South Carolina did at that time didn't really have a great basketball. Yeah. So um, he said, would you be interested in Mike? And I said, um, you know, coach, Mike's on my list. I said, but I'm not going to ask him to. Uh, and this is Mike Krzyzewski. Mike Krzyzewski. Who's, who's the head coach at Army at this time? Head coach yeah. at Army. And I said, Mike's on my list. And uh, I said, but I'm not going to ask him if he wants to be the coach. He's going to have to apply for the job. And the reason Mike was on my list was that a couple of years previous, three or four years previous to that, I was in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, while I was working for Converse after they broke up the region into three three territories. And I took the middle Atlantic. He said, uh, Coach yeah, I would call. So listen, Army's coming to play Navy. And uh, maybe you'd like to go see the game because uh, Mike is going to be staying at this hotel, which was a mile from my house at the time and a couple of miles from the academy. And I said, sure. So he said, well, why don't you go down? He, he'd like to invite you in to meet, have a pregame, a pregame meeting about the Navy team. And in that meeting, he has assistant coaches and Mike was very impressive. I mean, he was spot on because yeah. the Navy, I went to see all Navy home games because I was living right there. And I, I, I took a friend of mine who had diabetes and lost his sight. And I used to take him to, to the games. He's actually originally from out near Dixon City. He came across the street one time and 
name and and his name they was Steve Morgan or something. And and I and you were so his guy then. The the, games and I would. You were his guy then, the announcer. I was a, I was his guy. Yeah. So we'd sit in the stands, and I would announce the game to him. Yeah, way up in the corner, no one knew it was there. It was like and, and Navy didn't draw real well in basketball, and so. Uh, I remember him, uh, you know, very vividly because uh, we went to all those games and I got to know the, the Navy program because they let me play in the NBA, the Noontime Basketball Association for football and basketball coaches at uh, the Naval Academy. And so uh, I, I got to know Navy's program very well. And, and, and Mike's, Mike's plan for the Navy game was spot on. I mean, it was really, and when Navy plays army, it's not about spectacular plays, dunks and talent. It's about strategy. It's about the elements of basic coaching. Yeah. And it's, it's a really, a, it's a pleasure to watch play. So I thought he did a great job. And then I watched him during the game and Mike had this wonderful ability. I watched him coaching. When he spoke, his players were looking at him. They weren't looking at the cheerleaders or mommy or daddy or any distraction. They were focused on Mike. And I, that impressed me tremendously. Yeah. And so when Gal called me, and I had Mike. Mike was really at the top of my list, to be honest with you. Because I thought Mike, because of his experience at Army and the limitations of admission and requirements to do their work and, you know, be good citizens and everything would be perfect to recruit for if he could recruit to Duke more easily because at Duke, we didn't require our uh, uniforms or, you know, or, or a service and, yeah. and, 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 and so forth. But, so, but you are talking about, you're going against the grain quite obviously. Mike Krzyzewski is army basketball coach. I, I don't even know if he had a winning record, and now yeah. you're bringing him to one of the basketball powerhouses in the country, and it's all on you. Right. That's exactly right. As a matter and fact, Coach I'm, Gallagher. <laughs> well, not so much. I, I left Gal out of it. I, I never did uh, blame Gal for this. It was on me. So one time during the, uh, uh, the process, uh, Tom and I were sitting in the office, and we always went back and forth about talking to uh, about coaches. And he said, let me see if I got this right. You want me to hire a coach whose name I can't spell, <laughs> whose name I can't pronounce, has a losing record at Army to be the head basketball coach at Duke? I said, yeah, that's right. And he shook his head. He said, how bad do you want my job? He said, because he thought I was, you know, joshing like to yeah. get him fired to, to do, <laughs> make such an outrageous decision. Yeah, but he, he um, uh, we, we went back and forth over, and, and finally, um, uh, Mike and, and Tom blended together. And as and as tough as you think that decision was, and it was a challenge, by the way, because I don't know if too many people could make that decision. Uh, three years after Mike had been coaching, he had a losing record, and the whole world wanted to fire him. Yeah, I mean, everybody wanted to fire him. All the Iron Dukes and everything like that. And Tom Butters, to his credit called Mike in one time to his office and slid a piece of paper across the desk to him and said, sign this. And Mike kind of teared up a little bit, not teared up, but he could, Tom got the impression that Mike thought he was signing his resignation letter mm -hmm. and it was a five-year extension. And he had a losing record at Duke too, then that time. So imagine that. So Tom Butters, Deserves a lot of credit. I mean, I was a part of it, and I and and I enjoy being a part of it. But um, th that probably couldn't exist or happen yeah. nowadays with the with the pressure to win it now at all costs. And and what a decision it was. Maybe one of the greatest decisions in the history of college basketball. Who are the greatest? And I've had you for a long time. I'm going to give you a break, but two, at least two more questions. Who were the greatest basketball players at every level? Not the, the toughest competitors. Who stands out in your mind to this day that you competed against? Well, I think that that's a really a, a, a difficult, um, a challenging question. 
I think in college, I, I think Jack Marin, one of my teammates. Yeah. Was I remember Jack anybody. Marin in the NBA. Yep. Yeah. He played for 13 years with the bullets and he, and you know, he, he had a nice career. I mean, but he was really tough because he did a lot of things that you didn't recognize. I mean, uh, back then, you know, he dove, he dove on the floor for loose balls. He, he um, played great defense. Uh, he got dirty rebounds. You know, he got loose balls and, and he still scored and, um, and, and was a, a great teammate. I, and so I, I think Jeff was one of, I mean, Jack was one of them and Jeff Mullins also was one, but I don't think Jeff was quite right at Jack's doorstep is because Jack was about three inches taller yeah. than Jeff. And, and so, and then in the ABA, there were all kinds of great players. I mean, it, it was just. Wasn't, wasn't Connie Hawkins the Dr. J of his day and you got to be on that team with him? He was Dr. J before there was Dr. J. Yeah. And, and, and Connie and Connie was, um, uh, you know, banned by the NBA. Couldn't play because of some things. He went to lunch with a, a, some fellow who was a, uh, a gambler, but Jack. didn't gamble. Jack Molinas. Iowa and they banned him. And he never played a game at Iowa. Yeah. I mean, he didn't never played a, a college game. I've read Ball Four or not Ball Four. I read I read Foul years ago. It's a great book. What a good! It's, it's got to be one of the best sports that. books of all Wonderful. time. That's a great read, by the way. And funny, a funny book. And it is funny, but it's true. Yeah, yeah. it's true. yeah. And so, but Connie, Connie was a wonderful person, but he wasn't very physical. He was he was rather thin, and he was like a cat playing with the mouse. He, he would, he would make, if somebody did something he didn't like, he wouldn't try to out physical him. He'd make him look bad. He'd yeah. take the ball and reach behind him or with, the, cause he could palm the ball or he pretend he was going to throw a pass at the guy's face and he would duck or, and he'd still yeah. have the ball in his hand. He did a lot of nice, funny things to uh, get even with guys. And after a while, guys just, didn't bother him. And he got to the NBA, thank God. Oh, he deserved it. Yeah. He, yeah. Matter of fact, the NBA had a special draft. And and the draft was uh, the settlement with Connie Hawkins was that because he had a, the lawyers that sued the NBA, the settlement was that he was going to be, uh, they were going to have a draft. And the draft was that the team who won the draft had first place could pick. Connie Hawkins or pick the number one player in, in the draft. And that, I think that was back when Portland and maybe uh, Phoenix or somebody, I forget who it was. And so uh, that's, and then, and then his contract was already negotiated. They had already negotiated the financial terms of that contract. There was nothing to be discussed. The NBA paid dearly for Connie, you know, for, for banning Connie unfairly. Yeah, yeah. And so Connie wound up with a very nice career in the NBA, but a little too late. Cause I think he started when he was 26 or 27, 20, maybe 27, but he still played well, played yeah. in the uh, NBA all-star games uh, several years. So uh, Steve, tell me um, you were in charge of all these kinds of things as associate athletic director you see this uh, payments to college athletes coming. Yeah. Do you fear that it's going to irreparably change the game, change recruiting, f- concentrate talent, uh, and and all the fears that most of us as fans have? Well, it already has changed the game. You know, the the, the, the point of the matter, it has changed the game. Uh, let's take, for example, the quarterback at Wake Forest, I mean, at Notre Dame. I, from what I understand, he was offered uh, a, a huge amount of money to, to leave Wake Forest to go play Notre Dame. Isn't that remarkable? Well, yeah. I, I mean, wow. That, and and that's and Notre Dame to me is the epitome of doing things the right way in college athletics. I I know um, that Father Joyce and, and that their program is squeaky clean. I'm not saying they did anything wrong. They played by the rules. Yeah. But it changed the game. Well, I, it it actually hits me. As you just said that, it hits me to say, oh, my God, they they paid him more money to go to play there. That's crazy. It's, it's foreign. Yeah. So 
And so what's the end of it? I mean, where does it stop as far as getting money? Now, they're going to say that athletes deserve, you know, to be paid. Well, I'm not going to argue that, but I think they should have a plan that makes sense. Because from my perspective, you know, an, a, a scholarship is worth $60,000 most places or more. Mm-hmm. And that's free. That's tax free. You don't have to pay taxes on that. You get that. So four times that or five times that is $300,000 tax free to get an education and wonderful experience. That's that's not bad. Now, do they deserve more than that? Uh, or can they get more than that? Uh, that should be looked at. But the way it's structured right now, I don't think is healthy. The NIL um, is is just wide open bidding process. You just offer them more money and you get whatever you want. I mean, that's what it boils down to. So you're going to and 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 coaches are demanding longer contracts because you know they're going to their rosters are going to change from year to year. Yeah. You know what's the roster going to be next year? Well, I don't know who's who's up. For Somebody offers more money. Yeah. yeah, I mean, who's going to offer more money? And so it, it, it's going to change the game. And one of the one are there the contracts I, with these NILs? There, there are there contracts, or there can't be contracts. How does well, that they're, work? They're not the, the 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 contracts are not with the school. The contracts are with the businesses or men that are paying the money. Mm-hmm. They're like. They're like you with your millions of dollars. You might go to the University of Rochester and offer somebody a million dollars yeah. to play for Rochester. And you he signs a contract with you that has all kinds of obligations in there to you, not to the school. Yeah. So now who's the who is who's the, who is the athlete working for? Yeah. Are they working for you or I got beer. For? To go to Rochester, so that Obviously. worked out. Uh, so, you know. <laughs> you're, you're right, though. It 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 brings up a conundrum that uh, conundrums of all kinds. Sure. Well, think about it. How how does a coach coach two or three players? And let's just say basketball. And one 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 year, this player gets uh, three or four hundred thousand dollars. This happened, I think, at the University of Miami, if I'm not mistaken. A player made about five or six hundred thousand dollars and a kid comes in later the next year. And this kid was, I think, rookie of the year and all ACC. And the kid comes in later the following year and gets more money and he gets mad. And he says, no, I want more money. He says, I I deserve more money. This this kid's a rookie. I mean, he's new. He's a freshman. He's not. Well, the fellow who owned supposedly the fellow who owned. Uh, had the contract who had made that deal with him said, I, I've got a contract. I don't care what he wants. Yeah. He said, you know, he's going to play for that amount of money or that's it. So you, you're going to have, but there, there's bad feelings there. there there's bad yeah. relations being developed and there's emotions and you got relatively young, immature men, young men uh, negotiating big time contracts and being taken advantage of maybe in some cases, who knows, who knows what they're worth on the open market. So I, I don't know if it's the best thing. I don't think it's the best thing for college athletics, but I don't have any answer as how it should be done. Yeah. I just thought if they increased the $15 a month stipend, which was in place <laughs> probably when you were there and when I was in college, if they added, so. to, if they added to that number, Appreciably, it would have it would have made the difference. Hey, Bob, I stood in line for that fifteen dollars. I needed it. <laughs> it was big money then. Oh, yeah, it was, it was a big thing to me. <laughs> that was certainly your whole month of socialization. Sure. Oh, without question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this is it's it's crazy stuff. Uh, but uh, Steve Asendak, we appreciate you being with us so much today. And look forward to you being honored and them paying tribute to you uh, on October 31st at uh, Bonavita uh, in Dunmore. Uh, it, it's a great thing. Long, long overdue. Bob, if you'll let me say, first of all, I want to say one thing. I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I happen to live in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I can't tell you and everyone who may be listening or hearing this, 
how much it meant for me to have my values, my motivations, my aspirations and dreams come true if it weren't for the people that took time away from their own families and their lives to help me become a better person and a better athlete. And the people of Scranton, thank you very much. Mm. That's a good note to end on. Steve Vicendak, thank you very much. I'll shake your hand on the 31st. I'll look forward to it, Bob. Take care. Okay. (laughs) Bye-bye. You've got an appointment every Sunday morning at 1130 right here on WNEP-TV. They fought for us, now he'll fight for you. The pursuit of justice and liberty. It's the Bob Cadaro Show on TV.